we're all used to concrete and asphalt. And so what is the problem? Why is this a very serious and deadly, something as simple as this so serious and deadly? And it's because it causes urban heat islands. In this chart, we can see that basically the cities become hotter than surrounding areas. Extreme heat is becoming more and more a problem as we go on. Often cities even becoming 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than areas around them. At a roof or a wall, you know, getting up to like these, these really high temperatures, you know, of pavements, roofs, walls, when they sit in the sun, they can get incredibly hot in a way that vegetation and exposed water bodies don't get, don't get that hot. And the reason what led me to get into urban heat islands was because I used to be a green building engineer. I studied environmental engineering. I went to work in green, in commercial green buildings. And most of being a green building engineer is managing the electricity demand in buildings. So managing the peak demand from air conditioning is a central part of being a green building designer. And as I started to look into, well, you know, how do we get buildings to cool down so we don't need so much air conditioning that naturally led into looking at materials, green roofs and the urban heat island effect. Now it's really, the summer peak electricity is really interesting. There's this direct, very powerful relationship between urban heat islands and electricity. So this is a chart of New York. So as you can see, the summer load on the grid is actually double that of the winter load. And New York gets really cold, so it's still using a fair bit of energy in winter, and then it uses the least amount of uh, electricity during the fall and the spring, where it's more temperate. But this summer load is a really serious issue to manage for the electricity grid, and it's also a really serious issue that the higher the grid load is, the more carbon dioxide it puts out. And you can see that this is 93% more, I mean, almost double. I mean, that's a crazy load because cities get so hot. This is a really, really big issue. And so this was so fascinating. My co-founder, Nico, he's on the Slack channel. We got together um, in January this year and we thought, how do we tell the story of just how serious this peak electricity demand is? And so we looked at the California ISO website and that's the organization that regulates the electricity grid and it makes sure that man manages that there's enough electrons from all the different power supplies. And they put out this feed of data. It's, it's black and white. It's nestled deep into the website. Hardly anyone's ever seen this data or even heard of it unless you specifically work on it. And we made this really nice Chrome extension that, and we added a color to it so you could really visually see the real-time grid emissions. Now, the first one that's up there on the screen, it says that California is currently producing two 2.8 kilotons of CO2 per hour. And it's blue because it's really nice and low. And this is a wonderful number because as you can see, the chart's gone down here. And that's because we have lots of solar panels in California. All the solar panels are making clean electricity. Quite often, they actually make too much clean electricity. So there's too many clean electrons in the grid, which is a really wonderful problem to have. So we've kind of got it sorted for good, nice, moderate temperature days when the sun is shining. But then this is what happens when the temperature goes up. So you can see this one was taken from 8 p.m. So you can see, if you look at the same time, this is 10.30 in the morning. If we look at 10.30 in the morning on the hot day, it's already gone up to seven. It's already in the yellow zone. And then look what happens. Everybody's air conditioning on. It goes way, 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 way up. It goes so high up that it breaks our color scheme because we don't have any historical data where it got that high because of what Glenn was saying in his presentation, we're having these repeat heat waves that are pushing the grid beyond what it can supply and also pushing the CO2 emissions beyond what they've historically been. But wait, it doesn't stop there. This was the peak heat wave where it went not only to 13.2 above, it went all the way up to 17. It went three kilotons higher than we had a color for. So I had to highlight over it to show just how high it. Now, 17 kilotons per hour is absolutely insane, caused by the amount of air conditioners being used, when really, if we had not been having all those air conditioners being used, it would have been around the 2.8 level because the sun is out. So this is the lens of which I have come to to study uh, urban heat islands. And this is where all this electricity comes from. Big gas power station, there's 74 of them in California. They get their gas from fracking. They take it into these big factories. They set the gas on fire. So it's a heat wave. So then they set the gas on fire. Then it boils these big turbines. It makes steam. It makes electricity. So people can run air conditioners, which blow hot air out one side. So there's all these mechanisms creating more heating. On top of that, increasing the global CO2. So we can blow cool air on ourselves. This is something that humanity really needs to get on top of. When that happens, you get power outages. We just had rolling blackouts through California with the recent heat waves. 
There was a big one in Greece in 2004, Melbourne 2009, the Bay Area 2017. I've got to add another one now for 2012. Just not enough power stations. And we don't want to build more gas power stations. That's a thing. The people say you need more electricity. Nobody wants to spend millions of dollars on a polluting gas power station to try and make up for these peak air conditioning events. And then there's mortality. It's really surprising and disturbing how many people die from heat waves. Have a look at this. 309 people dying in the Midwest United States. And these are just like a couple of examples. There's so many more than this. Two and a half thousand people from a really big heat wave in India in 2015. And then there was this massive one in 2013. 15,000 people dying who just don't have homes that are built to deal with extreme heat. Their bodies aren't used to it. And it kills, extreme heat kills more people than all of the other floods, cyclones, and fires. It's kind of invisible, so it doesn't get the press coverage. There's also a big social justice issue. When you look at poorer communities, they often have like lower property values. They have uh, more concrete, less trees. If you look at wealthy areas, wealthy areas often have you know, a lot of trees, a lot of greenery, and they're in good climates. So there's a really big environmental justice issue here. Another thing is hydrofluorocarbons. If you look at one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases, what we usually talk about is cars and uh, fossil fuels. It's true, fossil fuels create CO2. But hydrofluorocarbons that come in air conditioners and come in fridges have a, an enormous greenhouse gas potential. So as we're making more and more air conditioners, more and more fridges, and these things are starting to get released into the atmosphere, they're also creating a lot of greenhouse warming. Right. And so this is a projection from 2005 to 2030 about the effect of these HC, HFC molecules. And if you look at the book Drawdown, this is the number one climate issue. And I don't know if it's the number one thing in Drawdown, why we aren't talking about it more. And the more artificial cooling we need, the more we need these chemicals. Another issue, so when we're coming into green space, so all these environmental issues all connect with each other, is urban runoff. So basically when it rains and there's a lot of paved surfaces that are causing the urban heat island effect, all the water, it runs off, it, it accumulates a whole lot of like chemicals and, and, and dirt, and then it goes off into natural waterways and pollutes them. And so what you really need to have is lots of soil. I mean, soil is a natural filter. It's full of microbes, it's a natural sponge. And so you want all of that rainfall to be absorbed into soil and going back down into the groundwater table instead of running off into, into waterways. And when I was researching this just a couple of weeks, it's not just the actual dirt and grit and oil and sort of whatever sort of garbage is in the urban runoff, it's also the temperature. So in one study I saw, it said that when all of this asphalt gets really hot and then there's a rain, and often there is a big rain event after there is a heat event, all that water runoff is quite warm and it can disrupt ecosystems. And there's a salmon population and it's egg breeding is particularly chemical to temperature change. So imagine if you pour like a whole lot of water, if you were to hose a really hot asphalt surface, that water instantly gets quite warm. And so it can disrupt the egg cycle. And so the salmon aren't able to, uh, to reproduce. This is something not many people know about as well, is crime. When it gets hot, people do more violent stuff, more rape, more murder, more homicide, more violent crime. They just think it's because people get agitated and crazy when it gets hot, and so they start fighting more, and then more things happen. But this is a really interesting chart on showing you the relationship between murders and rapes and aggressive crime just goes up, shoots up with temperature. So basically, be really careful in a heat wave. Don't, you know, if you drive, if it's hot, you don't know what's going to happen out there. Um, and also check yourself. Don't get into a fight if you're in line at the 7-Eleven. We all need to emotionally manage ourselves a bit better so we don't end up being in one of these statistics. And it's really quite striking when it comes to the economy too. There's one study that shows how urban heat island exacerbates the existing effects of climate change. So basically, when everything gets hotter, it affects the economy in all sorts of ways. People start taking more sick days. Crops don't start growing as much. Businesses start need to close down. A lot of people that work outside need to take days off. There's just a whole lot of losses in the system. So when you add urban heat, it just makes everything hotter than it already is going to be. It can actually take those losses up to 10.9% of GDP. Mm. If you're not somebody who studies a lot of economic data, that might not mean much. But so, you know, all of the major recessions, including the Great Depression and the recession in 2010, 
when they're talking about these really big recessions that have been a big part of a lot of people's lives, these are around about a three or four percent. Three or four percent loss of GDP is considered a massive recession. So when we're talking about 10.9 percent of what it could get to, we're talking a multiplier, a multiplier of three times the biggest recessions we've ever had. Okay, we're actually suffering exactly the previous slide where it's quite hot here and she gets agitated. So she's becoming violent towards me because we're actually a little bit overheated here. Ah, maybe she just needs to analyze some data. Let's give her yeah, some. Yeah, that's up. right. You want to go and analyze some data, sweetie? She desperately wants to go to the pool. It's a really big deal all around. Um, no matter which way you slice it, human, economic, environmental, climate change, ecology, salmon eggs, it's a really, really big deal. You know, do we really want to live in a concrete jungle like this? Or let's imagine a new future. What if instead of having these extreme urban heat waves that are really intense, really unpleasant and bad for everything, that we reimagine the world to be this green eco-utopia covered in rooftops, rooftop vegetable gardens, amazing green architecture, green walls. This is the type of future that I want to create. When I see how I want the future to be, it looks like this. And I think, how can I encourage people to make buildings be more like this? And I think, well, you know, let's show people pictures of urban heat and maybe they, I can inspire everybody to build more of these. And this is an example of my favorite building. This is my church. I spend every weekend here, the California Academy of Science with this amazing green roof. If we can do, I believe that if humans can make this place happen, this amazing green roof, we can do it here, we can do it a lot more. Here's another amazing one. This is a vertical green building architectural design that was done in Italy. And you know what? It exists. It's not just an artistic rendering. It's actually the same building that's in the back of my, um, my screen share. Uh, it's covered in trees. It has, like, this stuff is possible. This is not as hard as going to Mars or going to the moon. It's just a building with trees around it, right? We can do this. More green walls, totally doable. Not sure what a green roof is. It is just a, um, a, a membrane, as you can see, with a support mechanism and with some vegetation growing on it. This stuff is low tech, right? And this is one of the key answers to this big problem of urban heat is more green roofs. We can do, we can do energy efficiency for the peak electricity demand. We can do a lot of white surfaces and we can do a lot of trees, um, but green roofs are a really big part of it. And so just, there's a lot of different dimensions to this, but I just have a lot of stuff in here about green roofs because this presentation was about specifically designed to encourage green roofs. So if we, there's some really interesting data around green roofs. So one study showed that if we were to do as much green roofing as would be viable in NYC, that it would bring the, the temperature down by up to 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's an average temperature. So many of you here are environmental scientists and you realize that one degree on average is actually a really big deal just by adding lots of, of green roofs. Here's one in Chicago. And when we look at the temperature difference, this is the before and after you can see this really big change from you know, after they put the green roof on. Another one in Florida, you can see it's dramatically gone down um, the surface temperature of the roof since adding, adding the green roof. And this is a great chart that shows you once you add a green roof, your summer cooling load, the electricity or the energy it takes to keep it cool, look how much it goes down. It goes down by about 80% from putting on a green roof. So those earlier slides that showed you that big peak electricity that goes up, it's quite possible with a lot of green roofing that we could actually get that down. So widespread green roofing can reduce the need for air conditioning, which reduces the amount of gas and coal burned in power stations. Instead of shaving the top of mountains with mountain top coal running removal, what we can do is use green roofs to shave the top off the summer peak electricity grid. I hope everybody uh, likes the joke. Okay, it's also psychological. Green space in cities is really good for our mental health, our concentration and management of stress. There is an enormous amount of study showing the importance of greenery on mental health and happiness and well-being and all of that. So this one just says like looking at a green roof for 40 seconds can increase your concentration. So if you just like look out the window and instead of a wall, it's like green, you know, it's going to just sort of help you overall and also to help companies, employees be happier and more productive. Green roofs also remove smog from the air. So the more we have of these spaces, they can also help with air pollution. So a thousand square foot green roof can remove as much air pollution as 15 cars produce in a year. 
and air pollution is a whole other topic that it's actually one of the biggest killers in the world is air pollution and it's a really serious issue. They can cut down urban runoff by 70%. So we've got less stuff going into um, in the sewer system and affecting the natural ecosystems of lakes and rivers. So anyway, I could go on and on about this. But the thing is, this is where we get to the point. We're like, wow, there's so many things we can do to make a better world. But it's really hard to get anybody to do anything. Like, how do you actually make this world happen? Changing the world is hard, right? And it's largely because, for a lot of reasons, but there's this phenomenon that just because we know about something, right? We're edu say we're all educated about climate change, we're educated about green roofs, about all the stuff in the world, and we're really concerned. Behavioral science has proven that when we know about something, we become concerned about it. If you learn about the whales, the polar bears, you're genuinely concerned about it. But then this thing happens where it doesn't lead to action. So there's this huge chasm where people have a value system that they want to do something good in the world, but then they just doesn't lead them to take action. And this phenomenon is called the value action gap. And it's the core principle that starts off my book is letting people that this educating and getting people concerned about issues. It's just not strong enough to get people to take action. It's also called the information deficit hypothesis where people think, Hey, if we just tell people, if everybody just understood climate change better, then obviously everything will change and that is not true because intellectually understanding something is not a driver to action and that's where we have to get into the behavioral sciences this is where we go from environmental science and engineering and we take the segue into behavioral science which in my opinion is really where it's at right now as a sustainability practitioner and so this is what my book is about it's all about diving into how we can get over this value action gap to get people to do stuff to simplify it into three things that I think are really powerful. Number one is the public disclosure of data. Can we put the CO2 the electricity grid is putting out there? Can we put it on billboard screen so everybody can see it? Is it public? When we look at, say, for example, urban heat islands, I mean, nobody knows what their urban heat island is. That's why we're here today to start just number one, just get the data, make it public, make it visible. And this has been proven time and time again to be a powerful way of creating change. Okay, the second one is social comparison. Humans are primarily social beings. Intellectually understanding an environmental concern is not a very powerful way to create change. It's actually been studied to show that the more you care about an environmental issue, it doesn't really have that much to do with how you act on it. So we really don't need to be trying to get people concerned. We want to enable agency, a sense of like, I can do it. I can change the system. And one of the ways to do that is comparing us to each other. Like, hey, you use more electricity than that person. Hey, you've got more green cover. Hey, do you know your property is hotter than that? Or hotter than the other property? So any way that we compare one person to another person, a college to another college, a business to another business. And with this eco-stress data, we can tap into this core. We can compare, for example, all the universities to each other in a, in a city. We can compare the schools, the hospitals, the government buildings, whatever it is. It's a profoundly powerful way of motivating people to act. And then the third one is just simply adding color. People are very responsive to the idea that red is bad and green is good. And this is just a really natural fit for thermal imagery because it naturally just has this wonderful color profile. We are here to try and figure out how do we apply this to concrete? How do we apply these three design principles? Well, one, we can get thermal images. Now, this is an example of one that was taken. We're gonna be working, we're working with satellite imagery today, but uh, this is one that's been taken by an aircraft. So you can see it's really high resolution and you can see individual trees and households and it's really quite beautiful. This is how it would be done if it was done by aircraft. You can get this flow camera and put it on an aircraft. You know, if we ever get the opportunity to go to the next level and get extra high resolution imagery, but this is really what I'm hoping to achieve, which is to have this thing where you can compare each property. You can look up any property in a major city, but you can look it up and you can compare. You can say, oh, wow, like I'm 20% hotter than my neighbours. And this has been proven in, in many times to really affect people. And then people don't want to be lower than average. They're like, gee, I really better put on that green roof or plant that tree. And then we can give something like this, like a heat score. We can show people like out of 10, like roughly almost like a percentile, like 73rd percentile, you know, where you sit in reference to your city and something like this, like a, basically a comparison. Are you doing good? Are you worse or better than average? And then we can show something like this where they sit in there on um, the distribution of percentiles in their city. This is something that uh, we could potentially partner with electricity utilities to show people their thermal images and show people this data. As a way, a lot of energy utilities, they want people to do more cooling because of this extreme spike that happens with 
the air conditioning and the electricity grid. So there's a really natural fit for working with utilities to try and help them because the utilities don't want to pay for extra gas power stations. So instead of paying for extra gas power stations, they will pay organizations and people to help cool their properties down because nobody wants another gas power station. And just looking at these basic prices, you can see that like, I've just got a couple of these. The University of Michigan, a green roof, if they needed to do a green roofing, the green roof cost $464,000. Um, and a conventional roof would have been a little bit cheaper, but over its time, it saves $200,000 in energy savings. There really shouldn't be an economic case against them you know, too often. This is the one from Chicago that we saw before. It's saving 9,270 kilowatts per year, heating 740 million BTUs, but it's annually saving $3,600 a year. I mean, they're not like enormous savings, but they also, green roofs have so many multidimensional benefits in terms of human um, health, psychological health, ecological health, rainwater runoff, affecting like heat pollution to other buildings around it. And now there's another thing that we can do, which is calculating the green cover of all cities. Some of you might be familiar with these type of images looking at the NIR band. We also really want to be able to understand the percentage of green cover of all cities. So this green cover thing and this, this surface temperature thing are really a natural fit, sort of like a yin and yang going together. And then we can look at these basic like gamification designs, ways that we can use gamification and use the interface design to encourage everybody to get their green space up. Like I, so I did a progress bar here. We want to nudge them up. Can you get from 29%, you know, up to 35%, you know, like in the next year? Something like this. This is what I hope to achieve. Some kind of gamification of cities to encourage greening. And just for an inspirational example, this giant mega freeway, they ripped it out, right? And then they turned it into this amazing space. And this is not Photoshop. Like this is real. They took it out and they turned it into this great water space. So it really is possible that we can get rid of some of this really nasty urban infrastructure built and sort of greenify it. This is this one design I did where why instead of having all this exposed stuff, can't we cover it in like a vine cover, right? Stuff isn't that hard to do. Car parks, can they be covered in shade vines? These things are Photoshop because I couldn't find any pictures of them existing in real, the real world. Like why has nobody invented this yet, right? Here's some beautiful architectural renditions of ways that we can introduce, you know, more green space into traditionally, you know, not very nice parts of the city, like under freeways and stuff. And maybe we could even go all out and visualize it in like um, in these mixed reality kind of visions where we can actually put on these type of um, magic leap glasses. And this stuff has been really popular on Twitter, this artwork that I've made, where you could actually start to see what a, a fully green blanketed city would look like. And so I think that if you could see it in an augmented reality environment, then maybe that could also be a way to inspire people to jump over the value action gap and actually, you know, do the work of making it happen in real life. Here's another one for air pollution. Being able to actually like see the air pollution from sensors in, um, in a Magic Leap experience. And just some more examples of public space. This is the New York High Line. Some of you have probably heard of it already, but it's just an example of like what's possible. A few people got together, they had an idea, they had a dream, and they made it happen. And now New York is so much better because of this wonderful thing that they made happen. This is uh, the work of Patrick Blanc. He's a, one of the leading green wall designers. He does these really big architectural projects and they're really like artworks with leaves, with, with plants. They're amazing and really beautiful. And since he started doing it, more people have been starting doing it. So we can do A-class commercial buildings, but we can also do it low budget. They can be on schools. They can be really simple. They don't need to be fancy, really expensive things. We can always, if we can't green roof, we can always paint it. There's no reason why anybody can't use white, this white roof paint. There should also be no reason why it's restricted by income. Even if you can't do anything fancy, you can still buy planters and barrels. You can get them really cheap and you can just put some sort of greenery in them. This is available to everybody, no matter what end of the financial spectrum you're in. And also self-cooling. Okay, this is me showing you how unglamorous the existing self-cooling garments are. It's in one of the advanced challenges because I want this to be reinvented so I can actually wear proper cooling, but it does not look like this. This is terrible. You cannot go out wearing this cool pack like this. So this is an idea of like how I think it should be redesigned. Green roofs are growing, right? Installation of green roofs in the US has been between growing at 10 to 25%, which is high. And 
889 more projects in 2016. Okay, 2016 was a few years ago, but this is a growing trend. Cover it, blanketing cities in green space. That's what we want to make happen. And I'm just going to, about to finish up now. This is an inspirational ending. I learned this from an entrepreneurial conference in, in Oxford. The founder of eBay does this once a year, and I thought it was really cool. He writes this thing called The Headlines of the Future to ins inspire us for the sort of world we're making. We tend to hear a lot of doom and gloom, but I think it's better to imagine the future world of how it could be. Imagine that the New York Times says this, green wall boom cools New York City by 1.5 degrees, scientists say. Imagine this, the world's last coal power station closes. And you know what, like I'm on Twitter all the time, and there are headlines like this coming out now. You know, the last sort of fossil fuel things, we had Gary Newsom's announcement of ending the sale of combustion cars. We're starting to actually see these really big announcements of fossil fuels coming to an end in some places urban child happiness on the rise. If you've ever raised a small child in a city, it can be really difficult with the stress of the city that puts on you and the child. And we see all these things about children being stressed and children, uh, child depression and stuff. I mean, imagine if cities were these really vibrant, amazing places where we saw children being healthier and happier every year on. And then the biggie, we're over the peak, global CO2 emission goes backwards for the first time in 500 years. I mean, this is what we're all here to try and solve. This is the, our time. If you're alive right now, this is our big issue. I mean, imagine being able to see, to see the spike that we see going up so high. Imagine being alive to see it turn back down again. And that we don't need to live in this dichotomy between where cities are these noisy, urban, stressful places, and then nature is this getaway. I mean, why can't we reimagine a new world where urbanization and nature are interwoven and it becomes the same thing? There's no defined edge between the urban center and nature. We can bring nature into the city and incorporate it in so it kind of almost becomes the one place. I mean, this is the type of future I would like to see where urbanization and technology and nature all become together in one kind of symbiotic ecosystem. And I think as an environmental engineer or environmental scientist or designer, this is kind of our big challenge to get our imagination into this, into this space. Paris, London, Sydney. No, that one's New York. New York with green roofs. Sydney, that's the end. Major cities blanketed with green space. That's the future. That's what we're here to do.